Now, if you're doing AQA A-level physics, there are six practicals that you need to know about for AS level or the year 12 content. Now, there's another six practicals that you need to know about for year 13, and I've got another video up here that explains all of these in a huge amount of detail. And this is all at alevelphysicsonline.com. Now, in addition to the summary video, I've also got individual videos where I talk through each of these individual practicals in a little bit more detail. But let's have a look at what you need to know in year 12. First of all, you're looking at standing waves on a string and you can vary the length, the tension and the mass per unit length. We're looking at what happens when you have interference. So both a double slit and a diffraction grating. You're then looking at finding the value of G by a free fall method. You're looking at the Young modulus uh, and this is where you have a wire that is stretched. You then have a look at the resistivity of wire. Uh, so that's using circuits. And also using circuits, uh, you're looking at the internal resistance and EMF of a cell. So what I'm going to do is just summarise the six practicals in this video. Now let's start by looking at the apparatus for this first experiment over here. So what we have over here is our vibration generator, and this is connected up to a signal generator so we can control the frequency of how much the bit at the top goes up and down. Often through this you can thread a string. Now the string is going to be tied to maybe a retort stand at one end and then it goes along and it goes over a bridge, a bit like the kind of thing you might have in a violin. So, And what this does is it means that it's very easy to get a definite length of that string because it's going to go from this point here on the bridge to this point on the vibration generator. Okay, that's the length that we're interested in. This then goes over a pulley and off the edge of the bench. And what we have here are some masses. Now, what, as you add masses to this, what this is doing is causing there to be a tension here. Uh, and that's what we need for the, for the experiment. Okay, so um, pretty straightforward. And what you find is that uh, when you have this at a certain frequency, we get a standing wave. And the wave that we're interested in is our first harmonic at the fundamental frequency. And this is a wave where you've got a node at each end and an anti-node in the middle. So let me just draw that. Now in this experiment, we're going to be looking at how the frequency depends on these certain factors. So what we can do is we can change the length and we can do that by moving the bridge along and that causes our node to sort of move along. Um, so what it might be is that you're varying the length and the length might vary from maybe 0.5 to about a meter. Again, it really depends on the setup that you've used at your school. Once, that, once you've done that, you can then measure the frequency and you can read the frequency of that stationary wave off the signal generator. And then what you can do is you can then find values for one over F, okay? You can then plot some data on a graph. And what you should find is that you get data that looks like this and it should go through the origin. Now, the important thing about doing practical work is that you need to think about certain things for all of the experiments, okay? You need to try and take as many bits of data as possible, so preferably at least seven uh, different readings. Okay, there's your seven different readings. Uh, you should also remember to always take repeated values and then use those repeated values to find a mean, okay? And rather than just taking one value, we tend to plot this on the graph and then we can use the gradient or the intercept of this line for something more meaningful. Now, the reason that we do it like this is we can actually then work out the speed of the waves in that string or that, uh, that whatever you ha have there, which is vibrating. Now, the wave speed equation says that V is equal to F lambda. And because we're l measuring the distance from one node to another node, that's equal to half a wavelength. So we can then say that the wavelength is going to be equal to two times the length that we've just measured. Putting this back into this, we can say that V is equal to 2FL. We can rearrange this to say that 1 over FL is equal to 2 over V. And actually what we have over here is actually the gradient. Because if we look at this in another way, we can say that V is equal to 2 divided by 1 over FL. So this 1 over FL, because you've got 1 over F divided by L, that is equal to the gradient. So to find the speed of the waves in that material, uh, we can say that the speed is equal to 2 divided by the gradient. I hope that kind of makes sense. So one thing we can do is we can change the length. The other thing that we can do in this experiment is we can change the tension. And you change the tension by adding more masses down here. And what you'll find is that you might have a fixed length, you change the tension, and then you look at the link between the tension of that string and the frequency of the first stationary wave. The other thing we can do is we can change the mass per unit length. And we can measure this by just taking that string 
and you know you just have maybe one and a half meter length of it you put it onto a mass balance and record the mass um, and there's an equation that says that the speed is equal to the square root of the tension in the string divided by the mass per unit length where mu is equal to the mass per unit length and again you can see how this affects things if you play musical instruments you might realize if you have something like a violin or a guitar if you're changing the length of the string that's going to cause it to, to make a different note if you were to um, tune that to instrument using the bit at the top you could then increase or decrease the tension in that string and if you have different strings which might get thicker you then have a different mass per unit length now again depending on how you might set this up um, you can use different strings at the same length with the same tension and see how that then affects the frequency uh, for our fundamental frequency. So that is uh, just a quick kind of brief of how you might look at stationary waves on a string. Now when it comes to looking at interference effects it's often using lasers. Now the important thing about the lasers that we use in science um, and this is kind of thing there, there's you know, a question that could come up about how you can kind of deal with these safety, safely, um, is these lasers are known as class two lasers, and that means that they've got a power which is smaller than one milliwatt. Okay, it's not much power, but again, this is concentrated in a very intense beam, so you've got to be careful when you're using these. Often you'll be using red, occasionally you might have access to a green or a blue laser. Now the first thing we're going to think about is Young slit experiment, and this is where we have a double slit. Now the equation for this is that W is equal to lambda D divided by S. Now it's often, I often forget which is which. Um, S stands for our slit separation, so that's the distance between the slits. D is a distance to the screen, and W is the fringe width. And often when you do an experiment like this, what you might be doing is you keep the same slit separation, but you're moving something to and from a screen. So you're changing the distance to the screen, that changes the fringe width, and we can use this information then to find out the wavelength of that light. So you hold the double slit securely, and then you want to make sure that you know the slit separation in meters. Now, often this is actually printed onto that double slit, and it'll say exactly the slit separation. Sometimes you can use a traveling microscope or even a caliper, like a vernier caliper, to actually measure that directly. So you've got that as a known um, value there. You can then measure using a meter of the distance from your uh, double slit to the screen. So this is our distance D in meters. Now, you want to make sure that this is a non-reflective background. If you're shining it at something shiny, you might have a reflected uh, beam of light, which is still quite intense. So it's a good idea to use maybe a piece of paper that's attached to the wall. And actually, something you can use is a piece of squared paper. And that means it's easier then to take your measurements. What you're then looking at is the width of the fringe separation. Now, this value here, W, is going to be quite small. So it's worth counting from one slit, you can maybe count along another 10, and then you want to find your value for um, 10 fringe spaces, and then you divide that by 10 so you have less uh, errors there. So you can often do that just using uh, a millimetre ruler to then find the value of W quite accurately. You can then, uh, so you've got your values of D, and you change how far away this is. You then have values of W, and like always, what we can then do is we can plot some data. Now you should find that as your screen is further from the slit, then the width of those fringe spacings goes up and it should be a straight line that goes through the origin. Um, so what can we do with this then? Well, the gradient of this line is gonna be equal to the fringe spacing divided by the distance, okay? Now we've seen from the equation over here that W equals lambda D over S. So that means W over lambda is equal to D over S. Sorry, ignore that. W over D is equal to lambda over S. And that means what you can do to find the wavelength is you then work out your gradient and you multiply this by the slit, uh, the distance between the slits, and that should give you your wavelength. And it's gonna be in the order of about 600 nanometers if we're looking at red light, six to 700 nanometers. So that's the kind of answer that you should be aiming for. Now, one of the issues with this is that these um, are actually quite dull, and it's often hard to actually get a good measurement as we have um, the, the fringes which are kind of disappearing off into the distance. Not much light actually gets through that small slit. So a better way of actually working out the wavelength of light is to use a 
transmission diffraction grating. A diffraction grating has lots and lots of parallel lines and transmission means that most of the light goes through this. Now this is the equation for a diffraction grating. There's two equations which are sort of maybe a bit confusing. If you think about diffraction and then there's an un over here for n lambda. Okay so what we have is the, the spacing of the grating. Often on the slide that you might be using it will give you the amount of lines per millimetre but we need to make sure we convert this into the distance between them. We've got sine theta, I'll come on to theta in a sec. We've got um, which of the order of the diffraction pattern we're looking at, so it might be zero, one, two, three, and so on, and then you've got the wavelength of that light. So the equipment is set up in a very similar way to before, but now on the screen, what we get is as the laser light goes through that diffraction grating, we get a bright central maxima, and then what we find is that there's, um, at a point over here, we have uh, effectively, uh, constructive interference over here and so on and it should, oh that's rubbish line there, we should get the same thing on both sides. Now what we need to know is we need to know the angle theta. So theta is between this kind of central point here and whichever order maxima we're looking at. So let's look at theta over here. Now it's very difficult to measure theta using a protractor. So what you can do instead is you can measure the distance from here to here and you measure the distance from here to here because that's going to be a right angle triangle. And then it's a case of looking at Pythagoras and to find theta we can look at the relationship between the opposite side and the adjacent side. Now if we call this side over here the D, D because that's the distance from the diffraction grating to the screen and we can maybe call this distance over here H. And what we're going to find is that we've got H1, H2, H3, H4, maybe 4, 5, they often get a bit dull. Uh, what we know is that uh, tan theta is equal to h over d, provided we're both measuring everything in metres. So that then allows you to find your value of theta, which we can then plug into this equation. And again, what you might be looking at is you've got your values for theta for um, the first, second, third order maxima. You can then maybe plot, again, a small graph. And if you have your values of n and d sine theta, once again, this should be a straight line that goes through the origin and here, because d sine theta divided by n is going to be equal to our gradient, it means our gradient then is going to be equal to the wavelength of that light, which again should confirm the value that you had over here. So um, this one here, it's easier to get accurate results because you've got brighter points, whereas these ones are quite dull, and these are further apart, so there's going to be less error in your measurement of uh, that value there. So that is... Um, looking at interference using a double slit and a diffraction grating. I realise I'm kind of starting to run out of room here, but I'm going to get everything onto this one sheet of paper. So the next one is determining G by a freefall method. Now, this really depends upon the setup that your school has. I'm going to look at one setup where you're dropping something that goes between two light gates. So this is a typical setup. You might have an electromagnet that's holding a steel ball bearing in place. Now the reason for this is that when you turn off the electricity supply, that becomes demagnetized and this stops sticking to that and it just falls straight through. And that means that you can drop it from the same height above the first light gate every time. Your light gates, again, really depending on which kind of data loggers your school might have, this can be connected to a timer to start the timer and stop the timer. So what we're looking at here is the time to fall this distance. I'm going to call the distance between the light gates S. Now I could use H to represent that height, but I think S is useful when we come to look at some super equations in a minute. Now there's other ways you can do this. Sometimes you have a timer which is actually connected to that electromagnet. So as soon as that falls, it starts the timer, and then you have maybe a plate at the bottom that when it uh, causes a little switch to contact, uh, called a read switch, that stops the timer. Again, the setup really depends on whatever your school has. But the point is, we are varying the height that the ball drops through, and then we're recording the time. So what can we do with this? Well, let's just think about a SUVAT equation. We know that S is equal to UT plus a half AT squared. And here the acceleration is going to be caused by the gravitational field strength. So this allows us to find G. So I'm just going to replace the A with a G. I'm just going to, I'm just going to multiply both sides by 2 to say that 2S is equal to 2UT plus GT squared. And then I'm going to divide everything by T to say that 2S over T is equal to 2U plus GT. I'm just going to rearrange this now to say that 
2s over t is equal to gt plus 2u. And the reason I've done that is because of the equation y is equal to mx plus c. So if on our x-axis we have our time plotted, and on our y-axis we have 2s over t, we should then find that the gradient is equal to the gravitational field strength. So you vary the height between these two things, going from maybe 10 centimetres to up to a metre, depends on the height of your retort stand. And what we can then do is hopefully get a straight line that looks like this. Again, the gradient is going to be equal to our gravitational field strength, g, and the y-intercept over here should be equal to 2u. That doesn't really matter too much, but it's the gradient of this line that we're after. So that then allows us to measure uh, or determine the value of g by a freefall method. And again, g should be roughly equal to 9.81 meters per second squared, or 9.81 newtons per kilogram. Now we're going to look at the Young modulus, and this is a material property. And the Young modulus is equal to the ratio of stress divided by strain. And to work out stress, this is going to be the force per unit area, and the strain is equal to the change in length divided by the original length. So what we can do is we can take a piece of wire, we can stretch it uh, by applying a force to that, so there's a tension in that wire. Uh, we can then use this to then um, look at how that changes length uh, as we increase the size of that force. Two different ways to do it. One way is using a piece of wire horizontally that goes across the desk, which is quite easy and straightforward to set up. But if your school has the apparatus, we can also do it with things which are hanging. And that allows us actually a better way of measuring very small increases in length. So let's have a look at that first method over here. So what you have is a very long piece, often of copper wire. And if you can get the distance to be two meters or so, that's gonna give you a bigger uh, change in length, which is what's really important. Now, we need to secure this uh, really firmly at one end, and we need to make sure that that wire doesn't come out. So it's often a really good idea that you should wear safety glasses in case that wire snaps, and then you get this kind of sharpened bit of wire flying around the classroom. So securely clamped at one end. Um, we have a pulley at the other, which goes, uh, the wire goes over this and is attached to our weights. Now, as you add more mass, that means that uh, the mass times g is gonna cause a weight which is then going to be a tension in the string, which is our force, which is what's important over here. Okay, we also have, need to find a way of looking at the change in length. So if you have a maybe a, a centimetre ruler or a millimetre ruler over here, you then have a marker which you put onto the uh, piece of copper over here. It might be that you use a piece of electrical tape, it might be that you use um, an optical pin and some blue tape to secure it. But what this means is, is it's easier for you to then see the change in length. And what we're looking at here is a chain, it's a total length that goes from where that um, thing is clamped up to where the marker is. We're then looking at our change in length, L, over here. And in order to find the area, the cross-sectional area of that wire, that's going to be equal to pi d squared over 4. Okay, it is pi r squared, but we're actually measuring d directly. And to measure the uh, diameter of a piece of wire, it's always best to make sure you do this in maybe three different directions. So you measure the diameter using a micrometer or a vernier caliper. You then do it again and again to make sure the wire has actually got this kind of cross-sectional um, circular area. Okay. The other, the other important thing, which is a really kind of common question, is that you get maybe your distance in millimetres. We need to convert that to millimetres so that we have our area in square metres. Now, Young modulus has the symbol capital E, and that's equal to stress divided by strain. So that's equal to F over A over delta L over L. If I rearrange this, and remembering, of course, that our force is caused by the mass, which is mg, we can also say then that Young modulus is equal to MGL divided by delta L A. Okay, now in terms of data, what we're looking at is we are changing the mass and that's changing the extension of that wire. We can then plot these on a graph and we should get a straight line that goes through the origin because when there's no mass applied, there's no extension. The gradient of this line is going to be equal to MG divided by delta L, which we can see is something over here. And that means the Young modulus is equal to the gradient of the line times the original length divided by the cross-sectional area. 
Again, depending on the instructions you've been given, you can plot these the other way around, uh, and then you just do one divided by the gradient, okay? This is the kind of thing that they can ask you questions about because there's not just one definite right way of doing this. If you plot it like this, although it's maybe the independent uh, variable is on the y-axis, it does mean that your gradient can be used straight in this calculation. Again, there's so many different variations. Now, this is doing it along here, and actually what we find is um, even with copper, the extension isn't that big. Another way of doing it is hanging uh, two vertical wires, and it looks a bit like this. So this is going to be attached to a really strong point on the ceiling. We've got our comparison wire, and then we've got the wire which is being stretched. And what we have over here is a vernier scale, and this means if you see a small uh, change uh, in one, you can actually then read the scale um, accurately to get very, very small extensions, so less than a millimetre. And what you're doing is you're loading up uh, this one here, and you might go up to eight kilograms, and uh, that's just to, you know, it's a big mass that's applied, but remember that we're stretching metal, okay, it's not particularly stretchy. Again, what you're doing here is you're measuring the initial length, L, you're measuring your extension, delta L, and then what you can then do is record the force or the tension in the wire. You can then plot the data in exactly the same way, again, once again, and you can use this then to find the young modulus of that material. And things like steel are about 210 gigapascals, I think from memory, something like that. So that's looking at the young modulus with a simple method. Continuing our obsession with wires and looking at them, we're now going to look at the resistivity of wire using micrometer, ammeter and voltmeter. Again, um, the resistivity is a material property and it's measured in ohm meters. Uh, so what we do is we set up a circuit a bit like this. And what we have over here is a power supply that maybe goes from zero to six volts. And often these have got a dial on and that allows us to adjust the current and the potential difference. So we've got an ammeter in series, a voltmeter in parallel. And this is in parallel a piece of our sample wire. Okay, now we can vary the length up to maybe a meter. And often this is, you find, attached to a meter stick. And that basically at one end over here it's fixed and the other end we have a crocodile clip or something like that. And that means we can adjust how much of that wire uh, we're measuring the potential difference across. Now, um, a way that you might do this is you set this up and what you want to do is uh, keep any sort of heating effects the same each time. So what you want to try and do each time is have a similar kind of current which is flowing through the wire and you can use this by adjusting the power pack. What we can then do is we can take our values for our current, our values for potential difference, and that allows us to work out the resistance of that wire, assuming there's no resistance in the rest of the circuit. We can also look at how that varies with the length of the wire, which we just measure. Now, all going well, if you've got a longer piece of wire, the resistance should be higher, and these should be proportional, and we should then find, again, uh, a straight line that goes through the origin. But what's that got to do with the resistivity? Well, the resistivity rho is equal to Ra divided by L. And if you look at this, the gradient here is going to be equal to R divided by L. So that means the resistivity, because R over L is over here, is equal to our gradient multiplied by the area of that wire. And we work out the area of the wire in exactly the same way that we do when we're looking at the wire over here. So we're looking at the area being equal to pi d squared over 4. You take that value three times, you take your mean value to give you a good value for the area of the wire, which again has to be in square metres. And this should then give you a value of rho in ohm metres. And this last practical is looking at the EMF and the internal resistance of electric cells and batteries. So these ones here are the kind of big ones that we tend to use. You want to make sure it's fairly new because old ones it all gets a bit weird. So this is the kind of standard uh, cell that you might have in electrical circuits at school. So first of all, we need to set up a circuit with this, a voltmeter, an ammeter, and also a variable resistor to change the resistance of the external part of that circuit. So we set this up with a voltmeter across the terminals of that cell. And effectively what we're measuring here is our terminal PD, uh, and that's V. Uh, we're measuring our current in the circuit, and what we do is when we close the switch, um, we can read these readings here, and we can vary those readings by using a variable resistor. And what we're looking at having are a load of readings for the current and a load of readings for that terminal PD. We can then plot these on a graph. And actually what you'll find is when there's a lower resistance in this part of the circuit here, we find that a greater current flows, and actually that terminal PD falls. So you should get a straight line that looks a bit like this. Now the reason for that is that the EMF is equal to the terminal PD plus I little r, where this is our internal resistance of that cell. 
if we rearrange this, we can say that V is equal to E minus IR. And if I just rearrange this again, we can say that's equal to minus RI plus E. Now, again, thinking about our equation for a straight line, y equals mx plus c, we can see that on the x-axis we have i, on the y-axis we have v, and that means our gradient m is equal to minus r, so the gradient is equal to minus internal resistance. So if you work out the gradient, you take the negative value of that, and that will give you your value of uh, resistance in ohms. And that means your y-intercept should be equal to the EMF of that cell. Effectively, that's the EMF of this when there's no current flowing. So that is just a very quick summary of the practicals you need to know about for the year 12 physics. You will not necessarily be asked exactly how to write a method for one of these, but it might take some of the practical skills that you've um, amassed as you've been doing this practical work at school. It might use the same equipment, but maybe set up in a different scenario, or it might be using this and maybe linking it to theory. Who knows what might come up in any real exam questions. But at the very least, you do need to remember that you have done these during the course, and again, if you want to find the videos for Year 13, you can go to alevelphysicsonline.com, subscribe to the Year 13 material, and you'll see everything there. Until then, good luck in your studies. I hope it goes really well. Thanks for watching.